How is what? The sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, did a lot of baseball practices. So, um, got some nice days in there. Long, long days. So my boys earned a day off today. It's raining and they need some rest. And I need a little rest too. So, um, it's going well. Things are coming together. Uh, did you guys have a nice break? Yes. Uh, yeah. Anybody like go to the beach? Did you have good weather at the beach? Wasn't bad. Not bad. It was Very hot. You guys were in Orange Beach? No. Uh, in Galveston? Yeah. Yeah, Crystal Beach. In Galveston? We were on the island next to Galveston. Okay. Just swimming in the water? For a little bit. Was it cold? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it usually takes till like May or June for it to kind of warm up down there on the Gulf Coast, but. Yeah. Everyone, you doing all right? Yeah, I'm okay. How are you? I'm, I'm well. I'm, you know, um, you know, sometimes life throws you a hiccup. Like, I had a hiccup morning. Yeah. It was pretty frustrating. Yeah. How was your morning? Well, I thought I was having team pictures on Wednesday. Yeah. And team pictures, you know, by the way, is the worst day of the year for a coach. Because uh, you can't practice because you got all these dang pictures and button pictures and chaos okay so uh i got an email from a parent last night saying well i heard you didn't have practice today and pictures are tuesday and i'm like uh no pictures are wednesday and so i emailed our athletic director he said no we changed that on february 10th to, to tuesday and i had reserved an indoor facility because of the rain you know you're trying to plan ahead on these things yes and uh so i don't know i just convinced mr huswick to switch picture days with me uh, and then we'll see if the athletic director will go along with that. So maybe that hiccup is averted um, after a frustrating morning with that. Uh, other than that, everything else is kosher. So, yeah, what? Political parties. <laughs> Guys, this is a nice change up, okay? So really, the first half of this semester, right? We did two sections, and we did like the whole founding. We did the why, this form of government. We looked at history. We looked at political philosophy. We looked at our first two constitutions. We went through federalism, all kinds of stuff. And now we're moving on. Okay, and this is a night. This is an enjoyable, I think, uh, section for you guys uh, because it's it's <coughs> more relevant than historic, if that makes sense. Okay. So on page 62, I kind of have a little bit of an outline there. Uh, political parties, we're going to look today. We'll start on the functions of political parties. And then we'll get into um, why we're kind of stuck in this two-party system. As you guys know, remember the difference between a parliamentary and a presidential system, right? And so that's one of the reasons, but our electoral college is another, and there are other reasons as well. So we'll get into that Um and then we're going to look at minor parties. And those are always kind of a fun study, especially if you look at page 63, uh, right there across from it. Um, you look at some of these parties, all right? Now, some of these are regional. Well, and then there's the pot party, right? So what's the difference? Well, one might be in California and one might be in Colorado. So they're regional, okay? Uh, not national. Uh, when you look at national third parties, you can kind of see at the very top there. These are uh, parties that have run candidates for president that could have won the election, um, could have won the electoral college. They, they were on the ballot in enough states to get 270. Does that make sense? Um, if it's a statewide party, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to look up the pot political party and, and see what, you know, what they have. Now, the ones that have a line underneath them, there was a website for those parties. The ones with a line underneath them. Okay. The what? I have no idea. Okay. 
Okay. Next, this is probably the driest part of this, um, is the organization of political parties. At the national level, you have the Republican National Committee, the Democratic National Committee, and other parties have national parties as well. Then we look at the states and how the state political parties are organized. And then at the local level, for instance, the Sedgwick County Democratic Party is a local party okay, of Democrats. At the Sedgwick County level, the Republican Party is not called the Sedgwick County Republican Party. It's called Ava, the Pachydermy Club. You didn't know, you hadn't heard that. <laughs> the Pachydermy Club. Hannah. Oh, okay. Carol's got it. An elephant is a pachyderm. Because you like animals. <laughs> I know they don't swim. They do swim? Animals, they swim. It's a mammal, right? It's a mammal. And we know how to swim, too. Some of us. Most of us can swim. Yeah, I have a friend that cannot swim. <laughs> <laughs> Petrified. Okay, oh, yeah. so uh, that's some of the stuff we'll get into today. Okay, then the history of our political two major political parties. Now, starting on page 64, 65, 66, 67, and finishing on 68 are the history of the Republican and Democratic Party. And at the end of that, on 68, there's 18 questions for 18 points, if you so choose. I will put that in uh, Power School uh, and make it do Sunday night. Is that that'll give you like three questions a day you can ask? Sunday night. I was, but then second hour. We have the weekend. All right. I don't care. All right. So next, uh, and that's there's some interesting stuff in there. Okay. Uh, voter qualification. Okay, that's something we're definitely going to look at is voting behavior. People that why people vote, why people don't vote, why people can and may not vote. Okay. Um, and then looking at voting demographics, how certain groups of people vote. Okay, we already know some of this stuff, but it's kind of interesting to go over. Um, so, and then polling. Uh, we'll look at how uh, polling organizations do their polls. And this has really been difficult in recent years with the cell phone. Okay, because so normally uh, back in the day before cell phones, most people had a landline. If you couldn't afford a landline, there was a government program to help you get a landline for emergency. Okay, so uh, almost everybody had a phone. So when you call out, your chance you go through the phone book, close your eyes and pick some names, get a random sample of people. Okay, that's hard to do today. So we'll look at how polling works today, what you can trust in a poll, what you can't trust in a poll, and that sort of thing. Okay, you'll be a wiser political observer after this. Speaking of political observers, excuse me for a minute. Today is March 21st. Some of you have books. Some of you has, have asked me to approve your book. Some of you don't have books and have not asked me to approve them. You need to get a book and get it approved, and you need to read it. And then you need to write a three to five page book review by April 13th at midnight. So Wednesday? Why is that bad? How long has this been up here? I know. No whining. No whining. Now. Remember, you're pick, picking something from the political left or the political right, okay? What am I writing about in this read, right? I'm writing about the author, their style, their bias, the value of the work, 
is the book trying to convince people actually to think a different way, or is it just red meat for people that already believe the same thing? Can a high school student senior, after two months of government class, understand the contact content of the book? Or is it over your head? These sorts of things. Now, if you're struggling with figuring out what to write about, you can turn to page five in your book. Now, you do not have to use this, okay? And I will not be using this as a rubric, page five, okay? But if you're like, what do I, what do I write about in a book review? Well, here's some tips, okay? Now, if you're going to quote from your book, you need to cite the page number. I don't need a work cited if you have the title of your book and the author in the paper. Should have. Okay. Um, if you're going to, one thing people can do sometimes is read what somebody else wrote about that book, like a different book review. So if New York Times did a book review over the book you're reading, you could quote the person that wrote for the New York Times about this book, but then you would have to cite the guy. Yes, in a work cited page. Okay. Which is not a bad idea, especially if you're lost. Do I got confused? So you read what somebody else has said about this book. And that helps you understand. Maybe. Okay. Any questions about that? We will be turning those in on turnitin.com. Okay. As we get closer, I know nobody's written their paper yet. Okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, I'll get that up some point. Some point soon. Um, okay, so the last thing back to page 62 is I do it like a two day thing. It's kind of fun. Um, the first presidential election where the majority of Americans had a television in their home uh, was 1952. So 1952 was the first time they ran political advertisements for president on television. And there's a great website that I go to called The Living Room Candidate. And we're going to go back and look at some of the most influential presidential campaign ads since 1952. And it's, it's kind of fun, okay? Um, so that'll be, I mean, there's, there's a lot of lightness to this. You know, when I say light, it's not as heavy academically um, and more practical in nature. The last thing, uh, you see propaganda there propaganda there. And if you go to page 72, 71, page 71, many of you have seen this before in English class. Different types of propaganda, okay? And all of these are employed in our political process. I'm not going over this page with you. On the test, you will need to be able to match the title of the propaganda with a short definition of it. I'll give you like, yeah, and you tell me it's transfer or it's testimonial. It'll be matching. Okay. Good. You guys remember that from English class? When you read 1984? Now, some of you didn't read 1984. And you should go back and read it because it's happening. <coughs> Have you read Brave New World? No, but I should probably. It worked fairly well. You're reading it? Yes, I've read that. Uh, yes. I love dystopian stuff. I mean, you know, you know me. <laughs> this gives me stuff to talk about. Right? Okay, so are you enjoying uh, the Brave New World? This is cast people, right? We just finished it. Did you, did you read it? Did you like it? Good. You are like smarter human beings for reading that book, right? I think so. Yeah. That's uh, Huxley? Yeah. Huxley. Yeah. Okay. All right, maybe an audio book. 
All right, so let's begin with section three notes, political parties and voting. And we're going to start with a basic definition of a politi of political party. Guys, okay. get your notebooks out. Get ready to go. Section three, political parties and voting. <laughs> political parties. Political parties, a group of persons who seek to control government, a group of persons who seek to control government, in order to bring about, a group of persons who seek to control government, in order to bring about the adoption of certain public policies and programs. Bring about the adoption of certain public policies and programs. Political parties. Okay. There are five functions, five functions of political parties. How many? Now, if you remember on the last test, hi. public policies and programs. Remember on the last test where I had two point short answers? Name two. There are five functions of political parties. The first is the nominating function. Nominating. Now, I've gone over some of this with you, um, but it, it, it bears rehashing, okay? So, when we go back to 2020, the presidential election, okay, to define nominating candidates is choosing candidates. Choosing candidates. This is what sets political parties apart from Special interest groups. Interest groups seek to, you know, have an impact on government, but they don't select candidates. Parties select candidates. Follow me? Okay. So this is what kind of sets them apart. It weeds out the bad candidates. And the cream rises to the top. Right? Like in 2020, for instance. Uh, this boy should just give Sandy the job. It's coming anyways, isn't it? Huh? It's coming. Just give it in. I'm just gonna give in. Yeah. Take the easy way. Yeah. Just, just let it happen. Let it happen. He's still alive. Yeah. He's still alive. Faster still shooting. Ninety-six. 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 There were more. My mind is kind of escaping me here. Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang, Pete Buttigieg, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Tulsi Gabbard. Okay. 
Uh, former VP, Senator, 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 private citizen, mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Senator, Senator, House member. Okay. Now, guys, this process, when we get to 2024, okay, now Joe Biden will decide sometime probably next year whether he's going to run for re-election, okay? You kind of got to make that determination before a year out because you got to start to raise money, put together grassroots organizations in different states, and so forth. It takes time, okay? This process, running for president of the United States, lasts well over 12 months. In Europe, it's more like six weeks. They look at us and they're like, you people are crazy. Okay, but this whole process takes a long time. We have 50 states. We're a big nation. Okay, so in February of 2024, we will begin the process of weeding these candidates out. Okay, I don't know who the names are going to be. For each party. Now, if Biden chooses not to run, then there'll be a whole bunch of Democrats that put their hat in the ring. Okay? Republicans, we're going to see quite a few, and a lot depends on whether Trump runs or not. So some people won't run because Trump's running. If Trump's not running, that field gets bigger. Does that make sense? Because you have a certain part of the Republican Party that are Trumpers, that they're, I mean, that's their guy, okay? And some of those guys, some of those people were not Republicans in 2015, but became Republicans when Trump ran for president. You understand, okay? So we'll have to see on that. Um, you guys are going to be able to watch this live and in person, you know, as this unfolds in 2024. Now, we know the election is not till November. The general election. First Tuesday after the first Monday in November, every four years on even numbered years. Yes? So, the first two states will hold what we've talked about here before as primaries or caucuses. And traditionally, over the last 50 years, the first two states to go are what? Iowa caucuses. Good. The Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. Now, the Democratic Party is seriously considering changing this tradition. Because when you go to Iowa and you go to New Hampshire, it looks like this classroom. There are black people in Iowa. There's not a lot. There are quite a few Hispanics in Iowa. Okay. New Hampshire is very white. So the Democratic Party, as you guys probably know, right, relies a lot on the minority vote. So why are we hold why are they holding caucuses and primaries in these two predominantly white states? Is that is that smart for the Democratic Party? And so they're they're rethinking this. Okay, and you can't really blame them. I mean, it, I, I think, now I like this tradition because these are small states. Most of the population of Iowa can be found in three cities. New Hampshire is a small state geographically. So you don't have to have a lot of money to go out and campaign for six months in Iowa. You get your place at the Candlewood, Candlewood Suites, you know, you go out, you kiss babies, you shake hands, you knock on doors and introduce yourself to the people of Iowa. Same thing in New Hampshire. You don't have to have hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. So a relatively unknown candidate that has charisma has a chance in America to be president. If California is the first state, 
This makes it very difficult for somebody like that to run because that's expensive. It's a huge state. And you need a lot of volunteers. In Iowa and New Hampshire, you need volunteers, but not near as many as you would need for California. Does that make sense? So for the Democrats, maybe choosing like South Carolina to be first. Okay, it's a diverse state with a lot of Democratic voters, minority voters, okay, but not so big that it would be so expensive. Okay. Now Andrew Yang is a tech guy. You know what I mean? He's got his own money. Pete Buttigieg was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Not wealthy. Okay. But I tell you what, a lot of people learned out learned who Pete Buttigieg was when, when he ran. Jidj. Okay. And that's because of this this model. Okay, now. Bill Clinton ran for president in 1992. He was the governor of what state? Arkansas. For eight years, he's the governor of Arkansas. Nobody had heard of Bill Clinton. I didn't know who Bill Clinton was. Now, does anybody know who the governor of Arkansas is today? I do. His name's Asia Hutchison. Okay? And he's one of these. He's a rhino. Ava, you know what a rhino is? Jeez. You got to talk to dad, man. You know what a rhino is? Bergen? <laughs> Mrs. Fox is a rhino. She is a Republican in name only. A rhino. They run as a Republican, but they act like Democrats. That's a rhino. Guys. So like Mitt Romney. Kind of a rhino. Okay. Now, how do I get on that? Bill Clinton. Yeah. Bill Clinton. Nobody knows who he is, but he's a Southern governor. Now, you guys have seen him in his older age. When he was running for president in 92, and you'll get to see video of him doing this, because I got two videos during this section. On the Republican Party, yeah, he played the sax. He went on MTV, and they did a town hall, and somebody asked him the question. Governor, boxers or briefs? And he said, boxers, and everybody laughed. And then, you know, they asked him if he smoked weed. He goes, you know, I did. I did smoke weed, but I didn't inhale. I didn't like it, and I never did it again. Okay. <laughs> now, Barack Obama, he smoked weed, right? George W. Bush was addicted to cocaine for a while. No, 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 when he was younger. No, I mean, like, Laura, Laura, the first lady, Bush, I mean, like, he met her, and she, like, said, George, we're straightening you out. And after that, he never drank again. So he didn't drink, he didn't do any more drugs after he met Laura. She kills somebody? <laughs> no, Vice President Cheney shot somebody hunting, but I don't know about killing him. No, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. You know where I'm going with that. No, no, no. All right, here we go. So I'm talking about Bill Clinton. Okay. Now Bill Clinton has that nice southern draw. And ladies, you can be the judge when we watch the video of him campaign. Did you listen to Bill Clinton campaign in '92? What he says, you can have a Republican say today. He was a conservative Democrat. 
flavor. This is a southern goat. Okay, he's got that nice draw, and a lot of women thought he was kind of hot. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And you know he had he had some mistresses, yes? <laughs> yeah, but while he was governor, I mean, this woman came forward when he ran for president and said, I've had an 11-year affair, affair with Bill Clinton. Now, who broke that story? The National Enquirer. Well, the National Enquirer is the, the, you know, the, the, what do you call these things? The tabloid that you get on the, at, the, at the grocery store that says Angelina Jolie was knocked up by an alien. You know, that's the National Enquirer. They broke the story that Bill Clinton had this affair with Jennifer Flowers for 11 years. She went on TV explaining it. And Bill Clinton denied it. Okay? And he got elected president. Why? New Hampshire. He went to New Hampshire. Nobody knew who he was. But he spent six months in New Hampshire. Meeting people, shaking hands, talking about his platform, what he wanted to do for the country. And people liked him. Okay? And he took second at the New Hampshire primary. Did not do well in the Iowa caucus, but did well there. Guys, this propelled him to the presidency. New Hampshire did. Because his name is on the front page of every newspaper. He's the first guy they're talking about on the news shows all across the country for two weeks until they get to South Carolina and then Michigan. Okay, these are the first four. Now, Joe Biden did not do well in 2020 in Iowa or New Hampshire. South Carolina saved his candidacy. Because, listen, these are white States, okay, and a lot of the liberals in Iowa that are white liberals, and a lot of the liberals in New Hampshire lean far left. So they're pulling for these guys, the two socialists, okay. So Biden came in like fourth or fifth in these two states. Now James Clyburn, who's a member of the Senate, he's an African American senator or House, he's in the House. African American from South Carolina went to the black churches in South Carolina, went to all the black leaders in South Carolina, and said, We need to get behind Joe Biden. Because Warren and Sanders are not electable nationally. They might get the nomination, but they're not going to win. So Biden won South Carolina. He said he was going to govern as a moderate. Okay, so that's your moderate choice. Andrew Yang, young, hip, tech guy, you know, he had some crazy ideas. Like a universal basic income where the government sends everybody a check for $1,000 every month. People are like, yeah, 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 I want that. How are you going to pay for that? It doesn't matter. It sounds good. Santa Claus is coming to town, all right? Buttigieg was like, think about this. You got the old guy Sanders, the old guy Biden, Warren, who's off your rocker socialist, okay? Buttigieg is like the most clear speaking, you know, handsome guy. I know he's gay, but, you know, he's a handsome guy, you know? You know what I mean? So he got some traction, Buttigieg did, because of the other candidates, I mean, these candidates, now I like her, but Harris was polling, Vice President Harris was polling at 1% with the Democratic Party. Close to that. Cory Booker, uh, Senator from New Jersey, he drops out, she drops out, she drops out. Okay? And then, you know, it, Yang, hang on, you know, so you go through this process, and Biden won the nomination from his basement. Seriously, I mean, he, he did not go out, and when he did hold campaign events, they were like the driving. I don't know if you remember this. Like, people would pull their cars up, and he'd be talking on the stage, people sitting in their cars. 
Yeah. Yeah. So this is how the process works. Now, as I talked about a couple uh, weeks ago, Kansas is down here in May. And when we go in May, the same day, Nebraska, Oklahoma, North Dakota, South Dakota, I think there's like seven states go on the same day we do. Okay. Usually, we know who the candidates are going to be by May. So go back to 2008, John McCain for the Republicans against Obama. Now, we knew McCain was going to get the nomination. Republicans didn't need to have a big, a long primary season, okay? I mean, there were other people that challenged him. But Hillary, it was her turn in 2008. But then this guy from Chicago, this handsome kind of cool guy, Obama shows up and challenges her for the nomination. It was Hillary's turn. No, it wasn't. It was Barack Obama's turn. Okay? And so he won the nomination, but it went all the way to California in July. California's like the last state. So we didn't know who the Democratic nominee was going to be until July. Now, what happens in August? Okay, in August, you get the national convention. So the Democrats will pick one city, the Republicans will pick one city, and all these Republicans and Democrats will, you know, descend upon the city at a big arena somewhere, and they'll hold a four-day convention hosted by the Republican National Committee, hosted by the Democratic National Committee, okay? This is where they officially nominate the candidate for president, okay? Now, this convention used to be televised on network television all four days. Speech after speech after speech. Then they said, you know what? People would rather watch The Bachelor. So they took it off the network. And then we had CNN, and then you got Fox News and NBC, and then they ran wall-to-wall coverage for four days. And they said, you know, people would rather watch something else on those channels. Tucker Carlson or Anderson Cooper or whoever, okay? And so now you got to go to C-SPAN to watch it. What happens at these conventions? Not much. Now, they used to wait to announce this was the big deal, like who the vice presidential running mate is going to be with the nominee. They would wait until August to announce that. Then Al Gore screwed that up in 2000, and he named uh, Joe Lieberman before the convention. So it ruined the surprise, and he still lost. So now, and I like Joe Lieberman. He's still around. He would have been the Jewish, uh, first Jewish you know, exe- you know, executive up there, president or vice president. Okay. Um, anyhow, um, so now what's the big deal? Well, you got the keynote speech, keynote speaker, okay, on the last night. So they're going to bring in somebody that is the rising star in the party. So, for instance, in 2004, Bush was running for re-election against uh, whoever it was. But at the Democratic National Convention, the keynote speaker was who? Barack Obama. He introduced himself to the country on that speech at the convention. Because most people have never heard of Barack Obama. He was just a, he was a he was actually a state senator still from Illinois. He hadn't even been elected to the U.S. Senate. Okay. So you bring in kind of your top dog. And Mitt Romney ran against uh, Obama in 2012. The keynote speaker was not Donald Trump. It was Chris Christie, who's the, who was the governor of New Jersey. Kind of a rhino. This guy, and I like Chris Christie. He's a straight shooter most of the time. 
did not mention Mitt Romney's name in the entire speech. And we're trying to get Mitt Romney elected president over Obama. And he doesn't even mention the candidate's name. That's terrible. Okay. So these it's a lot of pomp and circumstance. The biggest thing they do now is they write the party platform. That is the party's stance on all the issues that you can see in writing. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit more about party platform later. Okay, so you kind of see how this process works. Then you got August after the convention, boom, they hit the road. They're campaigning, campaign, campaign, campaign. Okay, take a bus tour across the U.S., a train tour across the U.S., or just fly. Okay, um, and then they'll have presidential debates televised since 1960. The first presidential televised was Kennedy versus Nixon. Okay. And I'll show you parts of that, too, when we, when we watch some stuff, okay? Um, and, you know, th those are important, the debates. I don't know if the debates have ever changed the outcome of an election, like the poll numbers switched a lot after those debates. They can sway some voters. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk, that's intense. These presidential debates are intense, okay? Um, <laughs> Trump Hillary was, I mean, it was must see TV. Yeah. I mean, there's been some really good ones. I mean, like Al Gore, George Bush debates, uh, Saturday Night Live had a blast with those because Al Gore is very robotic, you know, and so they just go with that robotic thing and it's just, you know, it's funny. Um, so, anyhow, um, and, and then you get to the election in November. Okay. Yeah, so, the nominating process is very important, okay? Um, and remember, we do this with congressional candidates as well. We do this for gubernatorial elections, which are elections for governors. Yes, gubernatorial with a B. Gubernatorial <laughs> with a B. Okay, so right now, I think, uh, the only person that's announced to run against Laura Kelly that's a Republican is uh, Schmidt, who is the current Secretary of State of Kansas. Derek Schmidt, I believe is his name. Um, I don't know if there'll be any Democratic challengers to, to Governor Kelly. I doubt it. And you may have more uh, Republicans throw their name in the hat. Hopefully not Chris Kobach. Okay. All right. We already did that. We tried that. Okay. Don't do it again, please. Move out of state, please. Just go somewhere. <laughs> okay. Or just go into private practice. Go do something. It's not good for Republicans in the state of Kansas. Okay. Um, all right. So the, the, the cream is supposed to rise to the top. Do you know what the deal is with Ray Abbott? Um, he's, run, he's, he's running for re-election, yes, against Beto. Yes. yes. Why? He's in a wheelchair. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you're asking? No. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> well, see, it depends on where you get your news. You know what I mean? Like when Governor Brownback was the governor of Kansas, you could go back to the archives of the Wichita Eagle and be hard pressed over six plus years that he was governor to find any positive news story on Governor Brownback. Period. In the Wichita Eagle. Trust me, I get the paper, and it's like, dude, it's horrible. So you see this, I see this on Facebook, is that, which follow the Wichita Eagle on Facebook, and everything that comes across about a Republican is negative, every time. So it depends on where you get your news. Now, Brownback, maybe he wasn't a great governor. He did do some good things for the state, especially the pension system for our state employees, which is sound compared to a lot of other states because of Brownback. Because he made state employees contribute more to their pension because, guys, the, I think I talked about unfunded liabilities of pensions uh, nationally. This is a major problem uh, that people don't talk about or even know about. Okay, just ask the people of Detroit that used to work for the city that never got their pension because they went bankrupt. Okay, so Brownback did that, you know what I mean? And so all the teachers retired you know, cops and so forth that are in part of capers, now they're in a much better situation because of him, even though they hated him. 
the teachers union especially, they hated it. Okay. By the way, there is a bill in the Senate, state Senate, right now. Uh, Coach Rock sent something out about this where um, students would be able to choose whatever school they want to go to. Now, I didn't hear whether they could use to take their money with them and go to Carroll. But if you go to South, you can go to Andover, you can go to Mays, you can go to Godwin. You're not bound by your zip code. I don't know if that's going to pass. That would be interesting to see what happens. There are several states now doing this. We talked about this uh, the other day. Um, several states that uh, where kids, the, the money for their education will travel with them to other schools. So um, Kansas is now looking at that. I don't know how that affects the parochial schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now there is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to sit for uh, is it sixteen weeks? Is it a year now? Even if you move. Well, no. If you get you move, I think that's allowed. You can start over four years. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, and kids would go for specific reasons like that. Parents would move their kids to schools for sports or drama or whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, you people that uh, are in the in the fine arts department, I mean, or engineering department. I mean, think about, I mean, the public schools have a lot more, yeah, like AutoCAD. Can you learn AutoCAD at Carroll? Not really. Not a great thing to do. No. Can you learn that name? Yeah. 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 I didn't know. I didn't even appreciate it. Now you live in that district. Functions of government. We did nominating. Oh yes. So this is just one now. Now this is number two, informative function. Kind of self-explanatory. Yeah. To educate voters on issues. Yes. To inform them on issues. Okay. Now, this is increasingly less relevant for political. With the advent of television first, and now the internet, we can go anywhere to get information on these candidates and on their policies that they stand for. Yes, we can go anywhere. So there is a part in here where I talk about um, what the weakening of the parties, and this is one of the weaknesses. That they're losing this function uh, because we can just go to the internet. You know what I mean? Um, so. Yeah, that's the second one. And then we'll pick up on the third, fourth, and fifth. Manana. <laughs> 